Hi, I'm here with Andy Gracie from Australian Ethical. It's been a long association we've had with Andy and his team at Australian Ethical. So hello again under the radar, Andy. Hi, Rich. Well, medical technology and technology stocks are fascinating, but I think I'd love to start off with just a definition of what is ethical in an investment sense. So what gets rolled in and out from the get-go in an Australian Ethical Fund? Look, in terms of how we ethically screen, we've got a separate team that goes and undertakes the ethical screening process. So they look at every individual stock, they look at it against our principle-based charter, and they arrive at a recommendation, it's in, it's out. Circa... So that's an independent team from the investment team. Independent team, independent it's, it's, team. that's it, interesting. It's not the investment team that gets a rolled in and or out, and that's probably a strength of the process. We've got a separate team that is looking at the ethics... And they're not really looking at the financials per se, they're looking at how the characteristics of the company fit in against our principle-based charter. And I guess if you were to sum it up, like you've been doing this for a long time, what's sort of like, you know, because you have owned lithium stocks, so it is quite fascinating. It's not necessarily a static thing, is it? No, no, it's a, it evolves over time. It evolves, yeah. So circa 50% of the ASX 300 gets ruled out. So yep. 50% you know, by capitalization uh, is investable for us. And what it really means is certain sectors become more attractive targets for us. Yep. Healthcare, for example, that's really interesting for us. Information technology is another sector where we're considerably overweight. We tend to be overweight small companies over large companies because small companies are often more focused in terms of very specific industries and products, and they often kind of get through the ethical charter more easily. Is there a point sometimes where a company is in the fund, but then you're sort of forced to sell because it's not meeting the ethical charter anymore? Yeah, look, there have been a number of companies over time. You know, For example, in the early stages, we did view gas as a transitional fuel yeah. in terms of for a more renewables future. I think around 2011 to 2012, we actually ended up divesting all our kind of gas gas pipeline type investments because we no longer we were able to argue that it was a needed from a transition basis. So you know that's an example of change. And mining stocks, as I said, there was a point where you invested in lithium. Is that still... Yeah, look, 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 yes, yes. No, we do invest. We've got Pilbara Minerals. Yeah, so you own Pilbara here. Yep, yeah, we got in quite early there. It's been a, a successful investment. Look, we don't own any of the iron ore companies, right. you know, which in Australia is a big statement because, you know, you know, your BHP, your Rio, your Fortescue, you know, make up a significant part of the ASX 300 in terms of, you know, mining's a, a significant yes. part of that index. So, you know, we don't spend yep. a lot of time on mining. Look, we're interested in... Lithium, we're interested in the kind of transitionary opportunities. So copper is copper, 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 copper is really interesting to us, but it's very hard to get a pure play copper. Fire us. Yeah, it's like there, we haven't yet actually had some approvable Australian focused right. copper investments. And what uh, about like uranium sort of, you know, nuclear, even silex systems? Are, are any of those stocks under consideration? No, in terms of uh, uranium, because of the military aspect of uranium, it's never really been approvable for us. So, And I don't think that's going to change in the foreseeable. Okay. Basically, we're looking at energy, energy, energy when it comes to you know technology. Like data centers chew up a, a tremendous amount of energy and that's only going to increase. How do data, like, how do they fit in? Do they fit into your investment mandate? You know, the Macquarie Technologies or the you know, the other data centre owners? Look, we do. We've been long-term investors in Macquarie Technology or Macquarie Telecom, as, yeah. as it's previously known. Look, you're right in terms of their energy intensity has been going up and AI is only going to increase that even more. Generally, Macquarie Technology and data centre type businesses would get through our ethical charter on the basis right. of the, uh, the efficiency you know, the technology. Like Next DC, even? Next DC is investable for us. We don't invest, invest, right. invest in Next DC because we struggle with the valuation. Macquarie technology has been historically a much more supportive company from a valuation perspective to invest in, and we've held that for a long time. 
Yeah, so moving just quickly from the ethical mandate to the valuation kind of your area, once it tick the boxes, what is it that you're looking for? Because you've often said, you know, you like quality companies. So what is a quality company, Andy? Look, a quality company, we like to see companies with this recurring revenue streams. We are attracted to software business models. We look for as a company that's just not strong in the East Coast of Australia, but as a technology that they're trying to commercialise globally. So we've got a really a much larger total addressable market. We've got a strong kind of GP margin. Uh, yep. We've got a business that may not be at that fully scalable level now, but you can see a road to 20%, 30% cash EBIT margins. You know, it may be making nothing at the moment because it's subscale, right. but we can see the business has those kind of that those kind of bones, if you like, in terms of, you know, once we have scale and scale and software generally means 150, 200 million revenues these days, then we can start to see some you know, pretty strong returns for short shareholders. Definitely, definitely. And I guess, does that rule out contractors? Like, do they f- fit in your portfolio at all? Look, I, I struggle. I don't have any contractors right. in the portfolio. Look, you know, they always look appealing on a valuation basis, but... You know, there's always yeah, something well, going wrong with them. Uh, well, not always. Like Southern Cross Electrical, there are some contractors that do outperform, but it is more problematic considering what you're looking for. Yeah, look, he, and, yeah. And, and often in terms of from an ethical perspective, they are uh, supporting kind of industries that, we, you know, we personally don't support. You know, some of them are very yep. overweight mining or some yep. are very overweight coal mining or... Like, so, so we would struggle to get those companies through our ethical charter. Yeah, so I'd like to just drill down on some of the stocks that we've talked about in the past, like specifically Gentrack. Hey, <laughs> Gentrack has been like ticked a lot of those boxes. It's a New Zealand company, which I'm sure is close close to your heart. But uh, have you been taking profits in Gentrack because it's had such a great run? Yeah, look, we certainly have been taking profits. You know, we're still a substantial shareholder. Oh, so you're still you still a big you're taking sort of profits at the edges, and you still yeah, no, we've taken a reasonable amount of the shares off the table. Look, we've I know that we've we really kind of start to build the position around a dollar fifty Kiwi, and yeah. you know then it kind of recovered to two dollars before falling to down to a dollar twenty dollar thirty Kiwi, and you know we've been kind of probably selling from around three or four dollars, but just just so, you know look. We think there's still kind of valuation upside. We can still see transition being a massive opportunity in terms of, you know, how we as consumers use power. You know, we have to, at certain points in the cycle, you maybe use less power and, you know, batteries are coming into play and EVs, more and more of the population have EVs. And that all kind of changes the whole kind of dynamics of power and that transition's a multi-year transition and it's a global transition now gen track yes originally from new zealand very strong in australia also strong in water and electricity in the uk and you know they are really trying to branch out and to, you know they've been had some success in asia and that you know hopefully we're going to see some success in europe in terms of and, and also going up the spectrum in terms of the, the customers, you know, we want to see some of the larger players adopt the new Gentrack G2 platform. So are there any other stocks that you've been buying more recently that are similar to Gentrack that you think have that sort of level of potential? Uh, look, there's, there's plenty of companies with that potential. You know, Gentrack's obviously had a great re in terms of, you know, to the point now where we're a circuit billion dollar company trading at, you know, four and a half times sales, you know, which is which is not crazy in terms of against some other ASX listed software companies. When the market gets behind a, you know, a technology one, a wise tech, and we've seen Prometicus, in terms yeah. of some of the crazy kind of revenue models that the market's wanting to ascribe to those. So I don't think GenTrack, where it is at the moment and where the opportunity in front of is, is necessarily, has not crazily been priced by the market. So uh, in terms of the other new companies, look, you know, we are supporting some micro cap software companies in terms of and you know we're looking for growth with those you know we've had a lot of corporate interest in some of our micro caps over the last 12 months so are there any names that we might 
Well, look, Anne Serrata is a name. Oh, well, that, that's been taken. That, that's in the process of being taken over, and we hopefully the ACCC can jump through a few hoops and get this process further down the track. A company that we like and support and have been buying recently is the company Max7 yeah, yeah. Technologies. It needs Promedicus. <laughs> yeah, look, it doesn't actually compete with Promedicus. It, it competes in the hospital setting in terms of whereby images are shared amongst hospital specialists and nurses as opposed to the high-spec radiologist tool that Promedicus have. So it's a more enterprise sharing image piece of technology. Hasn't quite got the scale, has it yet, that, that, no, no, that, like that you were talking about before? No, it hasn't got the scale, but it is profitable, it is growing, and there's also a pivot within it in terms of towards more recurring revenue. A lot of Max 7's original business is, was sold as a upfront license, yep. whereas I think in terms of, like a lot of this software, we're moving to more of a recurring revenue yeah. stream. And they have that sort of accounting transition that they have to make. with the Yeah, profit. and they... And that, that's something that usually confuses the market a little bit in terms of when people see the top line not growing and, you know, but underneath the core kind of quality of the business is improving. And like a Max 7 has really probably underperformed like a lot of micro caps since the end of 2021 when the money basically retracted up into the ASX 100 and 200 and micro caps have received no love. The only part of the micro cap market that is been loved has been by private equity, you know, who, who've who come in and companies like a Ansarada, yep. companies like a, a Limeade, uh, yep. companies like a Damstra, yep. you know, and these are all portfolio companies for us have been acquired by private equity. And to be honest, it's not necessarily a, a fantastic result for investors, but it is the short term bump up in price and it helps your performance and things. But a lot of these companies, or some of these companies, if they remained listed and they kept some organic growth rolling through, you know, possibly you know you would have been better off remaining on this stock exchange. And I, I guess, like over time, I've always been very impressed with your knowledge of the medical technology sector. Admittedly, you know, Max Seven is in there, but I mean, even more so in the sort of biotech space and. Can we talk about that for a second? Like there's a capital raising as we speak for Immutech, which used to be called Prima Biomed, which has been around for a while. Could this be the growth capital that they need to really get front of mind again? Well, I think this whole biotech market is pretty interesting to investors. No, it's, it's fascinating from a science perspective. There, there also has been some investment successes, you know, companies like TLX, companies like Neuron, which have made small cap Australian investors a lot of money. Yep. And these both these companies are multi-billion dollar companies now. And so I suppose, you know, coming up on the ledger is a company like Emutip, which, as you say, is, is in trading halt today. It's raising circa $102 million, which it's going to use to fund a, a new clinical trial. We're in the late stage of clinical development in terms of whereby Emutip's drug in combination with Keytruda and a chemo regime is being used to clinically test a lung cancer patients. So that's going to be exciting for the market. Merck are putting in drug free of charge, and that's circa $100 million worth of wholesale price drug that's going into the clinical trial. And Imutip are paying for the, the clinical trial, but the, you know it's obviously a pretty close relationship when the leading immunotherapy drug developer, Merck, is actually throwing in $100 million bucks worth of drug into your clinical trial. They're obviously saying that this is really interesting for us yep. and, and the landscape for our drug, so we'll put our drug into this trial. But would you say, like, in the skew of your portfolio, having, you know, looked at different stocks, would it be more more medical technology rather than the molecular roulette of the biotech sphere, that where your orientation is? Or, like, how is your portfolio looking in terms of its exposure to medical technology? Look, in terms of the biotech or the, the, the pharmaceutical drug developers, we do have select exposures in terms of, you know, some of these names. You know, we've got a small holding in Clarity, for yep. example. We've got a small holding in Opthea. We've got a small holding in Emutip. And these are um, mid to late stage developers, you know, with very interesting respective technologies. But, you know, the positions are sized for the fact that these are 
playing in binary right. binary type fields. Right. If, so you've got like they're kind of your satellite kind of investments. So would you have bigger positions in med tech? Like would you be investing in nanosonics or would yeah, med tech exposure? Yeah, like in medical devices is probably our preferred right. kind of space. To look lower risk, you know, we've seen the successes of the likes of uh, Cochlear, you know, ResMed. CSL is obviously a very successful Australian company. You know, we don't invest in CSL within our all cap funds, but that's one that we could in the future. But you know, the success the medical device companies have had, Fish and Public Healthcare is another fantastic company, you know, within our portfolio. So these are kind of large cap Australian medical devices. And the beauty of these businesses is that they continually evolve their products. Generally, they've got consumable elements, you know. Yeah. The mask in the case of the ResMed or the Fish and Paco Healthcare and Sleep Apnea and Fish and Paco Healthcare in the hospital setting, you know, it's basically the consumable is the mask. Yep. So they've got really high quality business models where they make, you know, good GP masks right. on both the hardware yeah. and the masks. You know, Fish and Paco historically has been able to double its business every five or six years. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Like, oh. yeah. So, if the, you know, that some of these businesses are the Rolls Royce of business models in, in my Are opinion. they like com? with ResMed? There's a little bit of most of uh, Fisher Buckle Healthcare's business is fo- focused in the hospital setting. Okay. You know, it, it is involved in sleep apnea, yeah. you know, but that's a smaller part of its business, whereas ResMed is obviously very focused in, yep. in sleep apnea. So they, they do go at each other, on particularly on the mask supply side of business. But, you know, we really do like the medical device businesses, unlike the classical pharmaceutical drug developers, you know, your whole franchise can't disappear in a click of a mm. finger. Having not quite the same IP risk or... Yeah, look, I think it doesn't have, you know, you generally in terms of your, your, your domain knowledge, your expertise around, for example, sleep apnea in terms of ResMed, you know, you get very close to your market, you're innovating, you know, and it gets very hard for competitors to compete against you. Whereas in terms of the drug developers, there's... You know, for example, yeah. oncology, there's always new stuff coming through. There's always a lot of inf- innovation, and sometimes you can't even see where this innovation's coming from. And bang, you find out, you know, someone's got a superior cancer drug that actually kind of yep. kills your franchise. And just a couple of stocks quickly that people have been asking about. Is it Solnament's time finally to shake off the baggage of the past and get that scale that you were talking about? Yeah, look, Somnium, it's been a very frustrating investment for us. It's We've been involved with it for a long time. Look, I think in terms of the oral-fitted, dentistry-fitted sleep apnea devices, you know, they've certainly got a role in sleep apnea in terms of when people have both the oral and the CPAP, and some people just, and from a compliance perspective, cannot handle the CPAP in terms of their very light sleep. I think... Solomon has proven it is the market leader. It has proven there's a role for for their device in terms of the market. And actually it has innovated and it will be able to provide sleep physicians, you know, with data of sleep apnea events, you know, per patient. So it's new time soon. The rest assure the new program coming through, you know, which is lodged with the FDA. That can potentially change the game in terms of okay. bringing Sobermed into the digital age. And the same time, that you know, they've got the strongest core dentistry-fitted sleep apnea business in the world, but the cost of commercialising rest assured and the problems they've had in terms of manufacturing and things like that, I think probably, you know, we had this historically, which we've kind of zeroed off now. But I think they just underestimated the cost to commercialise rest assured an impediment is that like reaching a point where you think that you know they'll finally get some wins on the board in terms of they've had a couple of delays or they've had it delayed lately for like impediment has got all the the bricks in place to build a profitable long-term business you know i think we've got an fda approval you know we've got funding uh, but that, but there was a delay wasn't there on the reimbursement yeah, there's been a change in the management team there. Uh, yeah. There's been a change at, oh, at board, in board level as well. There's been quite a lot of change, but I think the impediment technology in terms of early kind of identification of lymphedema plays an important role. And I think what we're kind of battling now is specialist developed business models 
and the US, you know, to take advantage of this funding and they need kind of certain amount of scalability in their models. Mm. So I think, you know, we had all the building blocks in place and it, on paper it looked like it was all going to happen, but I think the side of the business whereby the US teams kind of build up their lymphedema businesses, that, that's been slower than, than we thought, but I, I think it's still coming. Yep. And just lastly, would you say that your portfolio is built around a couple of stocks, those energy utilities that you've spoken about in the past, you know, that are pretty, and I mean, they've always impressed me in terms of how, you know, ahead that country is in terms of its, you know, em- embracing renewables. Was Is that still the case in your fund? The, yeah, um, no, we, we still have investments in contact energy, contract energy, meridian the, energy, yeah, meridian and the, mercury energy. So uh, would they be a core sort of holdings, you know, Yep. Now they are um, they're core holdings. You know they they generate energy largely from hydro, yeah, but also geothermal energy sources. And we had a big announcement last week, actually, right. in terms of whereby TY Rio's committed to TY, and they've agreed to buy energy over a long period of time. The New Zealand government has got involved in terms of ensuring that the aluminium plant remains in terms of at TY. So we saw a good rally on those share prices on Friday, actually. Right. TY is a smelter. Oh, right. Okay. And it generates, its aluminium is a very kind of green source because it uses renewable energy. from well, their aluminium is, yeah. Largely from Meridian and also Mercury. Now they've contracted that for the long time. They've recommitted to this green aluminium, if you like, in terms of they see a future there. And that potentially was, you know, is, is a double-digit percentage of uh, New Zealand's energy supply that potentially, you know, was going to free up. But yeah. now it's kind of locked down. It just is going to keep energy prices reasonably tight in New Zealand. And it means that, you know, these companies... And also, a Meridian gets a big push-up in terms of... Because I think that contracted price for their electricity has been stepped up in the new contract. Oh, that's exciting. Andy, you've been doing this... For a while now, I hesitate to say how long. <laughs> but you get up in the morning and you've been doing this for a while. Has it changed much? Has industry changed over time? Or do you find that it's you know harder or easier than when you first started at Australian Ethical? Yep, this is my 20th year <laughs> at Australian Ethical. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, like it has been. Quite a few has, runs on the board there. Yeah, you know, like in these trials and tribulations and all investing and that won't go away there's things that you get disappointed with and things that you you know you're really really pleased with but I think that game hasn't really changed in terms of I think everything kind of the information flows a lot quicker now maybe than it did in in every way. But do you find that the ethical understanding of what's ethical has changed over time? I think uh, in terms of you know because of our DNA is in our principle based charter and yes we you know that we talked about energy and how that evolved over time and things things change over time but but fundamentally our screening processes is reasonably intact over a long period of time your things principles tend not to change a lot in terms of how you interpret your frameworks for companies you know changes over time i think the broader market is more focused on esg type it's kind of moved more toward to you sure sure the world has definitely moved more towards where you guys were positioned a long time ago. So that must make you quite proud or pleased. Yeah, no, the market certainly moved towards us. You know, we are now a $12 billion funds under management. You know, super is very important to us. But, you know, we're certainly trying to grow our managed funds business. But I think, yeah, the wider market is quite aware of ESG issues and even a more stricter interpretation of ESG, which Australian Ethical is, in terms of not many mm. managers would screen out half of the 300, you know, which we do. But I think, you know, that type of screening is more positively viewed than it perhaps it was five, ten years ago, you know, where people will say, well, you can't screen out that bigger part of the market. And But I think the gatekeepers, the, the Lon Six, the Zenith, the Morningstars, are more open, and investors certainly are more open to this to this high degree of screening than they perhaps were a while back. Well, thank you for taking the time to step us through Australian ethical sort of position at the moment on many fronts, and we'll look forward to talking to you again, you know, in the near future. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks, Andy.